Hello everyone and welcome to today's session on vulnerability management, the five vital tips for success. My name is Shannon Lane and I will be your moderator for today. It's an absolute pleasure to welcome you and thanks very much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us today. If you would like to ask any questions during the session, please use your question pane. Simply type in your question and click send. At the end of the presentation, we'll do a quick Q&A and take as many questions as we have time for. We will also run some polls during the webinar and a quick survey at the end. The aim of both activities is to provide you with some follow-up information and to ensure that we meet your information needs both now and into the future. So please take the time to let us know your thoughts. We have a great agenda for you today. We'll be sharing five vital tips for building and maintaining a successful vulnerability management program. We'll be looking at how to establish a vulnerability management strategy, follow vulnerability management best practices, get the right tools, resources and processes in place, feed vulnerability data into other tools for deeper intelligence, and to report and get the right information to the right people, which is all important. As a little background on Shearwater, we really help organisations to resolve four major security problems. We help organisations secure their applications, manage their risk and compliance activities, educate staff and uplift security skills, and manage security operations. So we have intimate knowledge of what it takes to deliver a great vulnerability management program because we deliver these services every day through our vulnerability management managed services and as a constituent part of our penetration testing services. Okay, so let's get started by introducing today's speaker. Mark Hoffman is the Chief Technology Officer at Shearwater Solutions and has over 25 years ex of experience in the ICT security arena. He has worked for both private industry and government and has provided a wide range of information security consulting services to numerous organisations across both public and private sectors. He is currently a certified instructor for the SANS Institute. He has a number of publications under his belt and has trained and lectured internationally. Mark is a handler for the Internet Storm Centre and holds numerous industry certifications. So over to you, Mark. Thanks, Shana. So one of the reasons why I wanted to go through this presentation is, well, other than to provide you some uh, valuable information, of course, is because there's a lot of um, programs that we look at where people are just not necessarily using the tools either the right way or most effectively. So hopefully we'll uh, address some of those issues today. There's usually three different reasons why people start a vulnerability management program. One of them is usually because of uh, some sort of standard somewhere. So if you're doing PCI or 27001, there'll be a line in there somewhere that says do vulnerability uh, management. So that's one reason why people have a program. The other reason they have a program is because the auditor came along and said, you need some sort of vulnerability management program. Um, one of the more uh, nicer reasons to have, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the program is to actually improve visibility within the environment. So basically the concept of you find it before they do. That's not the reason why I like vulnerability management programs though. The reason I like vulnerability management programs because of this slide here. This is a little bit older from Microsoft, but it's still valid today. Um, if you look in the bottom left-hand corner, there's a little red squiggle. That's basically the start of an exploit being reported to a vendor, say, like Microsoft. It starts being exploited you know, almost straight away, sometimes way before it gets uh, reported, of course, so with the zero days. But then when it gets uh, notified to the vendor, the vendor will start their patch process and they'll push out the patch within X amount of time. If you follow the blue line a little bit further, it's not until you get to the green, which is where um, exploitation really starts to happen. So the kids out there, they've really kind of um, pushed the exploit into maybe a kit or two, and this is when it starts hitting mainstream. So you, technically you've got, you know, potentially up to a month, maybe even two months, um, before things start going really bad for you. Now, that's not to say that there aren't exceptions to that, of course. Um, we saw that with um, uh, a few of the uh, issues during the year, but if you look at uh, one of the nicer ones this year, the uh, MS1710, that was released in March. You know, it got hit very heavily with WannaCry in May. So that's a, a two-month gap, and yet in May, people were still running around, in fact, 
most of us started running around trying to fix those issues after the fact. So if we get some sort of visibility into an environment to see what the actual issue is within that you know, month period, then you're already headed ahead of the game. So that's why I like a vulnerability management program. The whole reason for it is to get that early visibility in your environment so you have time to update and we don't have to front up to the board and uh, explain why haven't you put this patch on that was released three, four months ago. Now, a good vulnerability management program, there's a lot of different key components and you know, people, process and technology is kind of a, a mantra that we've used in security operations for quite some time and uh, it's starting uh, to take a little bit of hold within organisations. So we'll go through each one of those but we'll focus probably on the process a little bit more than the other ones. So let's have a look at people. What, are, what kind of people do you need in your vulnerability management team? Okay, now some of these are pretty kind of well do, yeah that's a bit obvious, but it's surprising how many teams actually lack some of these skills or the, the key skills. Ability to liaise with technical staff. So being able to talk or have, having people in the team that can actually talk to the technical issues as to why something is or isn't a problem. Uh, Fixing vulnerabilities in an organisation is, is often uh, a little bit of a selling job. You need to go and uh, explain the reasons why something needs to be fixed. Nobody likes to be told because, so it's always nice to uh, come to people with an explanation. So the team needs to be able to liaise with management because you need those, those windows uh, in order to fix things. Um, you know, we come across organisations that haven't patched systems or haven't addressed vulnerabilities for maybe three, four, five years. And the main reason for that is, oh, the business won't let us. Okay, so, so whoever drives this program or is part of that team needs to have the ability to go to management and say, look, you know, I understand that the business is important and it needs to have these systems up, but we need to find a way to address these vulnerabilities. So that's where the level of diplomacy comes into it, of course, because you, you know, whoever's job this is, uh, is going to be uh, dancing on a well pinhead, I guess, at some stage. So a level of diplomacy is kind of crucial. You, know, you need to have the technical uh, you know, the components. You need to have an understanding of the environment. A vulnerability is not necessarily a vulnerability, depending on where that actual issue is. I mean, if uh, um, if an issue is on an external facing server, then it probably receives a little bit more priority than something that's hidden away, maybe air gapped in some sort of internal network. So understanding the environment and how the vulnerabilities affect that environment is, is a, a key point. Understanding of the environment also to the point of actually knowing what's there. Okay? Again, we, we find a lot of the time that's a little bit of a challenge. We find organisations where we do a vulnerability scan or a penetration test and we come back with a report and say, oh, there's 35 hosts on this subnet. And the client comes back and says, no, we only have 12 there. There's a well no <laughs> Scans would suggest that you have, well, more than that. And it turns out in this particular instance that there were machines there that were supposed to have been decommissioned about two, three years ago, but they were just still kind of left behind. And of course, unpatched, not updated, etc. Um, the team needs to have listening skills because there might be good reasons why that business is refusing to uh, let you have the system for your updates and things like that. So, uh, you know, you need to be able to understand those as well. And of course, the team needs to have troubleshooting skills because let's face it, um, as good as many patches and updates are, things are still going to go wrong. And in that case, you need to be able to troubleshoot them and troubleshoot them fast. Now, you don't necessarily need all of these skills in the same body, the same physical flesh, but you know you do need to have them in the team in order to get a, a good, robust program. On the technology side of things, you obviously need a scanning tool of some sorts. I mean, you can do vulnerability management manually, uh, but realistically, you only do that if you really, really hate junior because it means that you know, going to a machine, checking registry settings manually, etc. Um, e even the most dedicated junior is probably going to end up potentially going postal at some stage if you do that. So some sort of scanning tool is probably a good idea. And of course an asset database. Uh, the asset database as in knowing what you should be scanning uh, is good. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. 
and some sort of way of ticketing. And the ticketing, I know it sounds like a, a little bit of a, a, a dur moment as well, but again, it goes towards the remediation. If you go to a team and say, can you fix this please? And you don't relate it to a ticket, then you lose track of it, it doesn't get remediated, so nobody knows that it should have been fixed, etc. So it's just easier to have some sort of ticketing system to uh, keep track of all of that. One of the things that we find with the technology that usually goes wrong in many of an organization is the, the access that the scanning engines have or the placement of the scanning engines. Um, we've had organizations where we've reviewed their vulnerability program and all of their scans say that every server has port 21, 23, 80, 443 and I don't know, 80, 80 open. And of course that shows you almost no vulnerabilities, which is great. The problem is, is that maybe it's behind a firewall. So in fact what you're seeing is just a scanned firewall 256 times as opposed to devices that are behind that. Maybe there weren't uh, the correct rules on the firewalls. Same thing goes with placement. Yeah, we've, we've had people scan subnets that just aren't actually accessible by the scan engine. So uh, let's say for example something silly, um, the scan engine is on a 192 subnet and they're trying to scan a 10 subnet which is not routable from the 192 subnet. So strangely enough they get no results and no vulnerabilities. The other one that we get a lot of is um, authentic, you know, authenticated scans versus unauthenticated scans. So in an unauthenticated scan you'll get some you know, missing patches of information. So we get people saying, hey, we only have these few patches missing. And then when you dig a little bit further, it turns out that they haven't got an authenticated scan which actually logs onto the machine, goes and checks the registries, goes and checks a whole bunch of other things, and then comes back with the information on the patches. So what they're seeing is, is kind of a, a little bit of a one-eyed picture. So access and placement is a technology uh, issue that uh, most organizations need to overcome. And it's just a matter of planning your deployments. So that's the technology. On the process side of things, you need to deal with all the information. This is where the real challenge comes into it. I mean, anybody can put a scanning engine in. That, that's not really that hard work. Uh, it's what you do with it afterwards that, that kind of uh, generates the work for the organization. So the process that we do is we, we kind of go through a categorize, prioritize, and then bite size it. So the main reason for the bite size especially is because the information can be overwhelming. You need to break it down. So we'll go through each one of these and we'll just step through. So when we categorize things, what we do is we sort the vulnerabilities into different categories. The reason we do that, let me just bring up the categories in the first place, there we go. The reason we bring break them down into the different categories like configuration issues or missing patches. If for example the majority of the issues that we identify are because of missing patches, we know A, obviously you're missing patches, but we also know that maybe your patching process needs to have a little bit of a review because, well, you're not applying the patches in a timely manner, therefore there's a problem there. And that problem might be because the team is under-resourced, you just don't have the people to, to go and patch. Uh, it might be because you have a, a business group that says, don't touch my stuff. Um, you know, that, that becomes very obvious when you look at these types of things. For the configuration issues, we, we often use it to kind of give us an idea of how well or, or not quite so well an organization maybe adheres to build standards. Now, when, when we do a vulnerability scan and most of the servers in the network, they look kind of the same as all the other servers, you know that they're probably using some sort of standardized build process. If you get an environment where server A um, looks vastly different from server B and server C, etc., configuration settings, maybe the, inter the network profile that they have, then you know that maybe server A was built by you know, John, uh, the server B was built by Kim, and server C was built by Pete. And they all have their own ideas about how a server should be built, so there's lots of differences. Of course, that makes it a lot harder for vulnerability management because it'll change the profile over and over again. So consistency and, and standardization is actually quite um, uh, helpful because it means you can detect uh, issues or changes in the environment much easier. 
the other categories we use is is things like outdated software. I mean, that's a pretty common one. Yeah, um, we all have scans coming up with you have Windows 2003 servers installed, or if you're really unlucky, Windows NT servers or you know, two Windows 2000 servers. Although I guess by now they might actually be becoming secure because <laughs> nobody knows about them anymore. Um, yeah, the other categories that we deal with is things like false positives. Okay. The false positives. The false positives that you need to deal with. Uh, every scanner will have a certain way in which it will try and identify a, um, a particular issue. So if we go back to um, Oh, it was early 2000s, Code Red. Some of you will remember that one. Uh, with Code Red, most of the vulnerability scanners on the market, they would look at a particular product number within IIS at the time. And of course, a few years after Code Red was actually fixed and patched, the product number never changed again, and Microsoft actually discontinued updating that product number. So the scanner would come around, find that product number, say, hey, that's an old product number, therefore you must be vulnerable to code red. It would give you the information and, of course, that would be incorrect because you were far beyond that particular release. So that, that happens quite a lot. Uh, other ones, uh, let me have a quick think. Um, mostly with some of the... Uh, the, the trickier, like the, the SSL and TLS ones, they can sometimes be a little bit misleading. But either way, you need to look at your false positives. If you have a lot of false positives, what does that show? Well, it shows you a little bit of a process issue again. It means that you need to, um, uh, you know, more carefully weed out the information for your particular environment because some of the, maybe some of the checks aren't relevant for your environment or they are just not helpful at all. The other category I use is the don't care or low risk items. Every environment has these and they'll be different for every organization. Uh, for example, you know, there's a vulnerability says there's a time ICMP timestamp issue. Those of you that run vulnerability scans, you'll know this one. Uh, it is firmly in the, yes, we should probably fix it at some stage, but we don't really care at this particular moment. We've, we've got bigger fish to fry. So they're the low risk items, the, the I'll fix later items. So the categorization, like I said, it'll show you process issues and it'll show you common trends of things that are going to go wrong within the organization. So when you, the next thing we do is prioritize. Now, of course, in every environment, everything's urgent, everything's important. I, 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 I hear your pain, um, but realistically, it's not. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. It, it's not everything's urgent, not everything's important. There are things that need to be fixed first. So you need to prioritize everything that's been identified in a, you know, um, in a sensible way. And what we do is we look at the importance of the assets. We look at the importance of the organization. So is this a system that if it's down or broken or broken into, that's going to be a game over? Or is it a, you know, I, I don't know, the telephony scheduling system um, to, to maybe, I don't know, get a call going to a particular person. That might not be that important to your organization. The risk to the assets, the risk of remediation, and the risk of not remediation, of not remediating. So a lot of organizations struggle with these two. The risk of remediating, this is the, the oh, if we fix it, it might break something. Yep, that's true. Um, Pretty much every major vendor, including Microsoft, has released patches and updates over the last few years that are going to break stuff. To be honest, that's what your test systems are for. And if you don't have a test system for your most critical application, then you need to find another way of either testing it or you need to build maybe some redundancy into it. So yeah, this might be a good business case for you. Um, the risk of not remediating, of course, is there as well. So what happens if we do not apply this patch? Well, with um, MS1710, for example, the risk of not applying the patch is that you have a whole network share with encrypted files. But that would be the risk of not remediating. Uh, the risk of remediation for that would be that you have to take systems down and maybe they haven't been patched for a long time, therefore they might not come back up. Sure, that's a consideration. 
So we look at all of these. The other one that we look at is the ease or the difficulty of remediation. Okay, and how we use that, I'll talk about when we talk about bite size. And the other one is the accuracy of the information. Vulnerability scanners will make assumptions and you have to be technical enough uh, to understand whether some of those assumptions for your environment are actually correct. So is the scanner actually accurate? Now a lot of the scanner tools that are out, uh, about on the market, they will actually allow you to do exclusions for certain assets, etc. So you don't have to necessarily disable a particular check. You can say for these particular types of servers, that check is okay if it comes back with a value of this, therefore I don't want to know about it. You'll still have a list of all your exclusions and your exemptions, but it won't show up in your report and make it all nasty and you have to explain why it's not important to be there. So here's some examples of uh, different things that pretty much should be familiar to most of you. The, uh, the, these ones are ones that pop up quite uh, often. So SIFS account password never, never expires, you know, you, you, that one, it ranks as severe. Probably agree with that, That's, but you know, if the password is 25 characters, then I probably don't care about it today. Okay, if you pass with six characters, then that one would worry me pretty much immediately. Uh, the SSL and TLS issues, well, we've had many of those over the last few years. Um, it's been ranked as a moderate, and again, I probably agree with that as well, mainly because a lot of those uh, SSL and TLS based attacks are actually quite tricky to uh, do, and you, know, you kind of have to be lucky to get the right piece of information. But if we go down to um, the Diffie-Hellman group smaller than 1024, that's the second last one. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, that one's ranked as moderate. Now, if this was on internet-facing servers, then based on the importance of my assets, I'd probably say, yep, I probably need to go and fix that one. If it was on an internal server, I'd probably put it closer to the bottom of the list. And to be honest, if I'm fixing my TLS and SSL issues, the chances of me actually fixing that by fixing the other one is actually quite high. So this one will disappear off the list when I fix my more higher priorities issues. And now we get my favorite one, Windows Display Last uh, Username Enabled. Okay, so in other words, it shows the username when you do a control or delete on the machine. Now, some organizations, you would argue that that's probably a big deal. And most organizations, you kind of go, yeah, that's in the don't really care list right now. We'll fix that when junior is bored or when we, um, you know, when we get round to it. So the tools will give you one particular score. You need to understand how your environment fits together and whether that score is actually relevant to your organization. And most tools, again, they'll allow you to um, change the scoring, so you can make it a little bit more relevant for your organization. Uh, but you just need to be aware of how you prioritize these ones so you can remediate it in a more appropriate. I like going for the, uh, the, the issues that have a big impact to the organization. Uh, I like going for the things that are easy to fix. The other thing that we do, uh, and that pops up with the categorize, actually, I should have mentioned, is um, the number of different vulnerabilities within an organization. So for example, if I have an organization where I have, I don't know, uh, a million vulnerabilities, okay, but 900,000 of those are all the same vulnerability just across a lot of the assets, that's going to be a lot easier to fix than an organization that has a million uh, vulnerabilities, but every thousand is a different vulnerability. So they've got a huge range of vulnerabilities to address. That's obviously going to be much more difficult than an organization that only has one vulnerability to fix lots of times. If you um, kind of use Google as an example, uh, a friend of mine, he works there and asks them, how many servers do you look after? And he says one, and which was kind of a little bit staggering to me. One server, that seems like a lot of uh, resourcing for one server. He says, yes, but that server is replicated 50,000 times. So, but he literally fixes one issue on one machine and that just gets replicated across all the other machines because they are all exactly the same. So, so there's a lot of value in that standardization, again, that we talked about a little bit earlier. Which brings me to bite size. 
So you've run your scan and you've uh, printed out the, the report and as you can see here, uh, page one of 11,670. Now just imagine when someone walks up to your desk and says, here's a list of issues, it's only 11,000 pages long. Um, <laughs> if you're still talking to that person after they've dropped that onto your desk, uh, well done. Uh, I would probably be maybe swearing quietly into my cup of tea or coffee at that particular time. So we need to break things down. When you drop a big bundle like this onto someone's desk saying, hey, here, go fix this, uh, it's not going to get done. It's like me cleaning my kitchen cupboards. You know, I know it needs to get done. Um, I look at it. It's a lot of work. I don't want to do it. I've got a big fun pile on the left and I've got the I don't really want to do it pile on the right. And strangely enough, my fun pile just keeps growing and my have to do pile, uh, you know, pretty much stays the same. So that's why I'm one of the reasons why a lot of the issues in organizations don't actually get fixed up is because it's just an overwhelming task. So what we do is we take it down to bite size. What we do in the bite size is we look at the priorities, we select what's achievable, and then we also look at the quick wins and the slow burns. And what I mean by the quick wins and the slow burns, that uh, Windows last name display, okay, I would put that into the quick win. Why? Because it was across a, a quite a number of servers and it is a simple group policy change that will affect all the systems, you know, and it takes five minutes to do and the risk to the organization is nil. Uh, so that's something that could be done quite easily. A slow burn though, well, maybe that's actually patching or applying a particular patch to a whole swag of systems, especially your production or your critical production. That requires maybe a little bit more testing. It requires a lot more effort uh, in order to get it right. So once you've broken it down into the, uh, the smaller portions, then you kind of need to liaise and negotiate with the different teams to get it done. One of our customers is a few years ago. We literally had a report that was about 30,000 pages and it was quite a, uh, a concise report. It wasn't 30,000 pages, you know, with one vulnerability and then 100 pages of explanation. No, it was basically 30, 40 vulnerabilities per page times 30,000. So quite a, quite a significant number. And the organization said, yep, we, we can fix those. And they had a good go at it for about six months and they reduced everything down to about 29,000 pages. So some progress, but not a lot. So what we did there is we kind of broke it down into the priorities, the quick wins and the slow burns, and then we just created a big list of stuff that the security team wanted remediated right now and stuff that we could live with for a little while longer. And what we did is we went to the server team and, and had a little uh, change that was group policy. Let's just pretend it was the uh, last name display one. And we went to the server team and said to the server team saying, hey, we've got this security issue that we'd like to fix. Um, what do we need to do to get it done? And, and we basically volunteered say, we'll even write the change control for you. So you just tell us what you need done. We'll write the change control. We'll submit it. We'll get it through the cab. And when do you think that can be done? And the guy looked at it and went, oh, I can actually do that now. That's a no impact, no, no change. If that helps you out, not a problem. And he literally did it there and then. Maybe not necessarily the right thing to do either, but yeah, we got something fixed by just going up and asking for one thing. So we did that repeatedly with the server team. We did it with the desktop team. We did it with the, some of the devs as well, where we picked a vulnerability that we would really like to get fixed. We picked initially some of the high impact, easy to implement ones. And then as we progressed and went back to the different teams, we kind of started increasing them towards the slow burns. The end result after about a, a month or so initially of doing that, you know, slowly going to the server team, slowly going to the desktops team, we actually started seeing that they were coming to us, which was kind of heartwarming really. Uh, when you see someone from the server team come up to you and say, hey, I've got a half an hour out of your list of things that need fixing. Have you got something that I can do in half an hour? And lo and behold, yes, we do actually. This one here should take about 25 minutes. You know, with your skills, might even only take 10. So great. 
So after another three months or so, they've reduced their uh, their thirty thousand page report down to maybe about five six hundred page report. Still a ways to go, but you know much better than what they started with. So you know breaking things down into small chunks. I can't emphasise it, it enough. Is something that you should definitely consider because people just look at this big pile of things that they need to do, and the fun things will always win out. So. At least they do in my pile. Um, things to scan. What should you be scanning? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm a, an aggressive patcher and I'm an aggressive scanner, so I scan everything. Uh, what if it breaks? Yep, it will. That's why we have a line on there that says test. Okay, so uh, generally, you know, your servers and your your desktops and things like that, they're not necessarily going to break. So you pretty safe with those. Things that we find that break are custom applications or um, old stuff. You know, if you uh, are going to tell me that, but Mark, I've got a SCADA environment here, uh, should I scan everything in there? I'm going to say, whoa, no, 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 you don't want to do that uh, because that'll probably be your last day at work. Uh, you'll want to be testing that in hopefully a lab environment that you have. And if you don't, again, good business case to get a lab environment. Um, so you know everything with a few qualifications, but certainly switches, routers, desktop servers, printers, printers. As some of you will know, or most of you will know, vulnerability scanners just love printers. Um, they always go a little bit weird. Most of them will have a little tick box that says, "Do you want to run the scans that irritate printers, or do you want to disable them?" Um, yeah, test it out on one or two printers that you have. Uh, spread throughout the organizations. Once you're happy, then feel free to untick that box. Otherwise, you might want to keep that box ticked. People will do the weirdest things. We, we did one scan, and the scanner was literally printing one letter to a page for every single page, and it was doing it like 2,000, 3,000 times. And the phone call that we got to the service desk is, is this printer is doing things. It's printing one letter per page. And we asked, what did you do about it? And the person said, oh, we put more paper in. So yeah, when you're doing these scans, maybe make people aware as well that maybe they're happening. And if there's anything weird, to uh, report it back to the service desk or the, the scanning team. Um, you need to take care. You need to stagger it. There's uh, nothing that will irritate your virtual infrastructure more than starting a scan on 100 servers that are all hosted on the same physical host at the same time. Uh, that's going to hurt, so you need to stagger the scans across. Now, most scanners, by the way, they're, they're relatively light touch, so they shouldn't bring things down, they shouldn't consume too many resources, but the computer is doing work that it wasn't expecting to do. The network um, load will increase slightly across the whole network, so you need to work that in, and you might need to stagger the things. If you are um, I don't know, scanning a remote location and it still has an ISDN connection, then you'll probably want to go slowly, slowly on that particular link. Otherwise, the people there will not be doing much at all. Okay. What about scheduling, though? So typically, we do server scanning outside of core hours for infrastructure components, um, and then during business hours for desktops. So, yep, you heard me correctly. That's during business hours for desktops. Uh, when you think about it, it makes sense because that's when your desktops are actually in the office. Uh, we did one for an organization where we ran the scan and we knew there was about 12,000 or so users in the organization, so we were expecting yeah, roughly 12,000 desktops or, or at least machines on the network at different stages, and we found that there were like 2,000. Uh, when we dug a little bit further, well, it turns out people take their laptops home in the evening, therefore they're not on the network, therefore they don't get scanned. So during business hours for desktops makes good sense. Maybe even during lunchtime, yeah, during that lunchtime period. Again, you want to stagger it, maybe floor by floor, but you know, I, I do like scanning those ones as well. Your dev test and UAT should theoretically be able to scan at any time. Um, and then, of course, how often should you scan? Well, you've paid a lot of money for your scanning tool, therefore you might as well make it squeal and uh, scan as much as you can, assuming you remediate. If you're not going to remediate, then one scan a year is going to be sufficient. If you are going to remediate, then you want to do it as often as you can because, A, that allows you to show progress. It allows you to um, show management that things are actually improving in the environment. 
it also makes management a little bit more aware that things change. Um, you know, the, the discussion we have on occasion is where uh, management comes back saying, look, we're doing all of this scanning, we're doing all of this patching, but the level of vulnerabilities in the organisation keeps on staying about the same. Well, yeah, new vulnerabilities come out, older ones reoccur, so that level might not actually drop for the first few months, but after a little while, if you keep at it, they should start coming down. Other uses for scanning tools. So, yeah, obviously they're great for vulnerabilities. Yeah, that, that's what they're built for. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they can't be valuable to other processes that you've got going on in the organisation. So for infrastructure side of things, we use them often for post-build validation. So the server team builds a server, um, then it gets handed over to the security team for testing. The security team tests the configuration. Uh, they build the uh, build standard into the scanning tool. So the scanning tool now goes onto the machine, authenticates checks all the settings that the organisation has decided are relevant for the organisation and then gives you a report on, yep, this build actually matches the configuration. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean it's secure, okay, it just means it matches the configuration that you said it was, but it allows you to run the vulnerability scan as well and that will show you whether there's any issues or not. So, that post-build validation will do the configuration validation and a lot of organisations, of course, use the vulnerability scanner with patch for patch validation. Now, a lot of scanners had the issue where the patch validation was seen as being unreliable, and the main reason for that is because the scanners were, well, let's face it, a little bit thick. What they would do is they would check for a particular uh, KB or a particular version of a DLL or a particular registry setting, and if it wasn't there, then the patch hasn't been applied not allowing for patches to be superseded. So most of the scanning tools that I'm aware of, they've now fixed that problem. So now if you get a patching report out of your scanning tool, it should theoretically match what you get out of your WSUS or your um, uh, patching tool. So, so patch validation um, might not be 100%, but it's going to be better than not doing it at all. The other place where we use vulnerability scanning quite a bit is in application uh, management. So pre-release testing and post-implementation testing. So this is where the vulnerability scan becomes part of your software um, development lifecycle. So you write a piece of code, it's in dev, you run a vulnerability scan, okay, and then you uh, run the scan again once it's moved to UAT, you run the scan again before it moves to prod, and then once it's been implemented to prod, then you run the scan again just to make sure. And then you can automate these things because, again, a lot of the scanning tools will have some sort of uh, scripting or API capability. So, The other reasons that we use scanning tools, um, you know, the scanning tool is going to log on to every machine, so you can go and get the software that's installed on there. Uh, my personal favourite, certificates used. So the scanner is going to go around the network, find all your SSL connections, all your TLS connections, pull the certificate, bring that information back down so you can run a report that actually says which certificates have I got installed, are they self-signed, are they actually purchased ones, when do they expire. So you will have an idea of maybe uh, doing a report where it shows you the expire or the tickets, the certificates that are going to expire in the next 90 days or so. Uh, you can buy an expensive tool or you can use the one that you already have. Things like registry settings, um, this is where um, the tool can go through the registry anyway. We usually pull things like the run once key, so this is where malware likes to hide in order to execute the next time your machine starts up. So bring those down. Configuration information, I already talked about that, so your CIS benchmarks, for example, you can put in there. You grab the local users, we usually um, review the local users, any new local users that have been created, that might be a, uh, an indication of a compromise. Asset management, because it's going around the network, it'll pull out everything that has an IP address and try and identify it. You match that with your own asset list and make sure that it's uh, the same. This is how we often find rogue devices on the network. We've suddenly got a swag of D-links on the network that weren't there yesterday. Uh, and of course the environment changes go with that as well, so not just a network profile but also actual systems that have changed. 
And of course, the last one, which is the most fun one, which I kind of skipped on the last screen because we're going to talk about it here, is input into other tools. So you can use the information from your vulnerability scanning tools to pull into your scenes, uh, but also in, often into your intrusion detection system. So now you can make your intrusion detection system aware of the vulnerabilities you have, and then depending on which one you have, you can set the alerting up saying, well, if I see this attack and I know that machine to be vulnerable, I will scream really loud. Uh, if I see this attack and it goes to a machine that I know is not vulnerable, then I will alert at a lower level and people don't have to quite jump as quickly or as high. So, so there's plenty of other uses for your scanning tool that you might not have thought of. So I, I guess just before we um, kick off in the summary, Mark, what I might um, get um, you, everybody on the line to do is just uh, take 20 seconds for a quick poll to see what your organization's biggest channel is, challenge is when it comes to vulnerability management. Uh, do you think it's technology, resources, or process? Sure. Alrighty. So, well, thank you very much. No worries. I'll go back to not quite sure. Okay. So, the, the summary, yeah. So first tip, establish a vulnerability management strategy. Um, understand why you're doing it. So if you're doing it for compliance reason or audit findings, that's perfectly okay. Uh, but you know, getting that visibility and getting ahead of the game is, is one of uh, my usual drivers. And of course, the uh, strategy will need to have the people processes and the technology. You need to have the right people that can talk to the business. You need to have the uh, process to categorize and prioritize and make it into bite size and you need the technology to actually get the information that you need. Okay. The, sorry, my screen is not, there we go. Sorry, my screen wasn't changing. Um, the second tip, follow vulnerability management best practices. So do your scans, scan as much as you can, do timely remediation, don't leave it lying around for the next uh, six months. Uh, we do scans in organizations. One year we come back the next year and the same issues are identified. That's essentially throwing money away really. Uh, so you need to do that timely remediation and then re-scan to make sure that the issue is actually uh, uh, remediated and stays remediated. That's an important one as well. And use that categorized, prioritize and bite size you know, way of uh, breaking things down into manageable chunks. Get the right tools, the resources and process in place. We talked about that. So that's, again, going back to people, process, and um, uh, technology. Yeah. So having the right tools, making sure that you're happy with the tools, making sure that you get the right reporting out of the tools. And also, if, for example, configuration management is one of your big things, then uh, the tool obviously needs to be able to do that. Feed vulnerability data into other tools for deeper intelligence. You have the data already, so identify what else the tool can actually do. Um, I can pretty much guarantee you that if you pull out a report that says these are the certificates that are going to expire in the next 90 days, someone in the organization is going to love you. So, you know, have a look at what else the tool can do for you. Have a look where else that information might be of value. Your SOC or your SIEM team will, will love you if you can provide that information to them in a timely manner as well. And that's, again, going back to the regular scanning. So identify what the tool can do. And then for the reporting, get the right information to the right people. You know, provide uh, uh, information to uh, the relevant teams within the organization, but also management. So management will want to know, but uh, they probably don't need to know what specific vulnerability there is, but they do want to see you know, what the changes are in the environment. And I think that brings us to any questions. Okay, thanks, Mark. That's been uh, fantastic. Um, we would like to open up a little bit further to questions. We have received a couple already uh, that I'll uh, run through now. Uh, the first question is, what metrics would you use to assess the effectiveness of your vulnerability management program, and what does management really want to see? So management typically wants to see improvement in the, in the, in the program. So if you are now remediating things maybe once every six months, being able to demonstrate that you are reducing that amount of time to maybe um, you know, one month or, or one week, that, that's something that will be of value to them. They just want to see the bigger picture though, typically from a management perspective. And they want to see that improvement. That's probably the most uh, key thing. Okay, thanks Mark. Um, 
Should vulnerability tests be done before pen tests? That's another good question. Uh, this is where Shannon's going to hit me. Um, <laughs> absolutely. To be honest, uh, and and I'm pretty sure that's the view of most people uh, in the organisation. Uh, if you're doing a penetration test without having done vulnerability testing prior to that, you're throwing money away. And the reason I say that is because, yeah, penetration testers. <clears throat> Uh, and, and I was one for years, uh, we're kind of lazy people on occasion. So if there is a really low hanging fruit, then yeah, we will take that low hanging fruit. So if you have a completely kind of bozo vulnerability in the organization, um, we'll take advantage of that. So if you do the vulnerability uh, process in the first place and then remediate the bigger issues, then the penetration test can actually concentrate on the trickier things that the scanning tools can't do, which is the, you know, the complex linking of vulnerabilities and issues and data discovery, etc. Okay. Thanks, Mark. That's great. Look, I've got another really good question here. What is the risk of outsourcing internal vulnerability uh, management or vulnerability testing capability? Oh, good one. Um, that kind of depends on, I guess, who you're working with and what information you're going to get back with it. So, and and I'll, sorry, but I guess this is a little bit of advertising. We we work in kind of a hybrid model. So this is our particular approach where we work as an extension of an internal um, internal management team or an internal security team. So we work closely with the organisation, and the organisation has access to everything. If you're relying on the outsourcer to only tell you when there's things that you need to know, then you're probably not getting the value out of a service. You need to be able to have visibility of what's there because, let's face it, you know your environment. The outsourcer probably doesn't, and that's probably where the biggest risk lies. They don't necessarily know or understand your environment. Therefore, they may miss things that are crucial to your organisation. So. Okay. That's great. Thanks, Mark. Um, and one, uh, I think we've got one extra question that's coming in now. Uh, what tools would you recommend for vulnerability management? Oh. Bit of an open-ended one, that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, of course, full disclosure, we, we, we pedal Nexpose and, and uh, Tenable so products, so they are the two that we uh, uh, work with. Um, Retina has uh, a good rep as well, so that's a, quite a nice little tool. Um, to be honest, you need to look at the tool of what it's going to do. So if you need, for example, a passive environment, if you're doing passive scanning, then uh, the, the Tenable suite, for example, has some really nice solutions for the passive, probably a little bit better than uh, some of the other vendors. Um, if you need to scan AWS or, or Azure components where instances pop up and pop down, then you know some of the uh, kind of more reputable commercial products will actually hook into that infrastructure and scan stuff as they pop up and are shut down. So you'd need to look for that. So it's a little bit of a um, hard question to answer, to be honest. Uh, it, it really depends on what your requirements are, but you just need to look for the tool that solves that. Okay. Um, so um, I'm just going to back to the metric for executive. You mentioned they want to see improvement, but how actually would you recommend you show that? I.e., a percentage of reduction, uh, reduction of criticals over a period of time, or um, oh, awesome like question! I like that one. Thanks, Tim. Uh, <laughs> the uh, the improvement. So you can show it in in two ways. You can kind of go. Um, oh, how do I answer that one? You can kind of go over the overall number of vulnerabilities over time, but let's face it, it's the critical ones that you really care about. So I would see a reduction in the critical issues in the organisation as kind of a first metric and the how, how fast do we remediate things overall as a second metric, but I definitely want to see a reduction in the critical. If I'm not seeing a reduction in the critical, then as a management, management person, I would kind of look at that and go, yeah, what's actually happening here, people? So, yeah, good question. And uh, one other question. Um, are there any free, easy-to-use vulnerability tools uh, for testing available on the internet today? Internet yeah, today? So, so a lot of the vendors will actually have a community version. So Nessus obviously has their community version and they have their, um, uh, what is it, their professional feed, so that's about 
1500 or so US dollars a, a year. Nextpose has a community version which has uh, got some limited licensing, Retina does as well. Some of the other vendors will have some sort of community version. If you're going to go for full open source, there is OpenVAS. So OpenVAS is a branch of Nessus before it was brought back as a closed source product. Um, OpenVAS will do the job. Just be aware that OpenVAS uh, tends to have a lot of false positives. So um, you will be spending quite a bit of time solving the false positive issue. Um, okay, fantastic. Thank, thank you, uh, Mark, and thank you for those excellent questions, everybody. Look, just as a, a quick, uh, I guess, roundup of uh, the quick poll that we conducted, uh, it looks like that uh, the results are in. So from a technology perspective, 25% of you viewed that as your biggest challenge. Uh, it's obviously not, not adding up to 100%, so you voted a couple of places twice, which is fine. Uh, resourcing looks to be the biggest challenge, around 65% of you mentioned that, and process uh, for another 55%. So um, thank you for, um, for contributing there. Um, I think that wraps it up from a, from a question uh, perspective. So again, I'd like to uh, thank you very much for attending today's session. Uh, everyone will receive a copy of the recording of this session via email, and we'll also be posting you today um, to posting this session today to our website. So uh, thanks again, uh, and have a great day. Really appreciate it. If you can hang around afterwards and complete that uh, quick survey for us, that again would be fantastically helpful because it helps guide what uh, what we'll present from a webinar perspective into the future. Thank you all.